Hello and welcome to the Dynamic Leaders Podcast, part of the Talent 409 Leadership Academy Network. I am your host, Colin Cernelia, and thank you so much for joining us today. Please head over to talent409.com to learn more about how we can help your team or organization with their leadership and culture development. This podcast is available on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast. Plus, don't forget, you can now play this podcast on any Amazon-enabled device. Just ask Alexa, play the Dynamic Leaders podcast. Getting Dynamic Leaders with Colin Treniglia from Apple Podcasts. Before this episode begins, please consider taking a minute and leave a rating and review. Doing this really does help us grow the show, and you can get featured for your review on a future episode. Okay, we roll on to episode 125 of the Dynamic Leaders Podcast, quarter of the way to 200 episodes. (laughs) Seems like we're rolling along, still a long ways to go to get there, but... A big milestone nonetheless, and I am super excited for today's conversation. You will get to hear from Nancy Hogshead McCarr. Nancy is the CEO of Champion Women, which supports the legal advocacy for girls and women in sports. Nancy is also a former competitive swimmer that represented the United States in the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles, California, where she took home three gold medals and one silver medal. Nancy and I talk about a bunch of topics on this podcast. Some of the highlights include the grueling workouts it took for her to make it to the Olympic level and how that's changed over the years since Nancy competed due to things like scientific and technological findings. We also talk about why reliance on community has aided her in becoming successful in competition and in life after swimming, how you can support legal advocacy for supporting women of sexual abuse in Olympic sports, and how we can better ensure that girls and women have a great experience in sports. There is so much good content in this episode, but I do want people to know that there is some sensitive material that Nancy talks about For those who don't know, Nancy was raped as a college student at Duke University. She has bravely opened up in this conversation to talk about that experience, what she learned from it, and how she is helping other victims of sexual abuse since that unfortunate experience for her. That part of our dialogue comes in around the 11 minute mark, so if that is something that you'd like to bypass because it may be a trigger for you or it's just something that you can't handle at this moment for whatever reason. That is why I want to let you know when that comes into the conversation. But if you can take the time to listen to Nancy's story, I think you will hear just how powerful it actually is and really hear about the amazing work that she's done since that unfortunate time. Again, to help others who have unfortunately become victims of sexual abuse, not just in sports, but in the larger general population. And the highlight for this episode is community. You will hear Nancy say that word numerous times throughout the conversation today. Community helped her win three gold medals at the 1984 Summer Olympics. Community helped her recover from that rape experience at Duke University. Community has helped her continue to push for legal advocacy in supporting women in Olympic sports to get better protection, to get more rights so that they can have great experiences in competition. I truly think this is one of the most powerful conversations that I've had on this podcast, both when I first had the conversation with Nancy and then when I was going through and editing the conversation. It really struck me how vulnerable she was, but how open and honest she was as well and how much I think that not only helped me understand what I can do to help prevent sexual abuse from happening in the future, but just how she didn't let that become her defining legacy. She was able to move on. She was able to build on her life and do so many amazing things and continues to do so many amazing things today. So this is a conversation that has a lot of elements sensitive and not 
It is still an amazing conversation and I can't wait to share it with you. So let's dive right in and let's discover our talent altitude. Here is my talk with Nancy Hogshead McCarr. Welcome back to the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. Today, my guest with me is Nancy Hogshead Maycar. Nancy, uh-huh. <laughs> thank you so much for joining the show today. Thank you for having me, Colin. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. We have so much to talk about. Your background is so interesting and diverse. And I always get excited before I ever get into the conversation with a lot of my guests, but especially with someone like yourself. So before I get too far off track, I do want to give you an opportunity to tell the listening audience a little bit about yourself. So please tell us, who are you? Oh, okay. Here we go. Um, <laughs> gosh, I was I was raised by people from Iowa, and you never brag about yourself, but here it goes. I had to overcome this one, which is, so uh, it's Nancy Hogshead Makar. I'm an Olympic champion from the 1984 Olympics. I'm a civil rights lawyer, and now I run an organization called Champion Women, and we provide legal advocacy for girls and women in sports. Beautiful. The 1984 Olympics were in Southern California, correct? That's correct. Los Angeles, uh-huh. I'm going to have to ask my parents. My parents were living in Southern California at the time, and I know they went to a bunch of the Olympic events. I'm going to ask them if they remember going to any of your events or if they even remember you specifically once once we get off the phone here today. Yeah, well, if they did remember me, it's usually because I swam in the very first event and I tied. It was the first tie ever in Olympic history. I tied with my teammate, another American, Carrie wow. Steincipher. And, um, right. So that was pretty historic. So if you just say, yeah, remember the woman that tied, (laughs) (laughs) you might remember that. (laughs) Fair enough. That that'll be a good trigger to, to see if they remember. So, all right. Well, since you brought up the swimming, let's just start right there. A lot of my guests and yourself included have athletic backgrounds. And most of the time we spend on here is going to be talking about what you learned in competition and how you're equating that to what you're doing in your life after sport, which is to this point been the longer part, I'm sure of your life. So it is going to continue. But when we talk about competition and swimming, I read that this is something, and, and this is the type of sport where you have to get involved pretty early on, and you were competing at a pretty high point at a pretty early stage and compared to some of the other sports. So can you talk about like what it took to compete and be that serious about your sport before maybe some of your peers were getting that serious about sports in general? Sure. Well, I'm actually having this rethinking of my sports experience. I thought that I had to train as hard as I did in order to be that good. But it turns out that now that the current athletes who are swimming much faster than I was are not training as many yardage. They're not doing the yardage that I was doing. And so I'll tell you what I did, but just know that if you want (laughs) to, if you're interested in being a swimmer, that it probably won't be quite this grueling. So we, from seventh grade until I graduated from high school, I was up at 4.45 in the morning. We swam from 5.30 to 7.30. Then my school went from 8 to 4. In the middle of the school day, while most people were doing PE, we lifted weights or ran on alternate days. And then it was two more hours after school. So it wasn't something that one gets into lightly. Wow. It's not, yeah. I never thought like, well, I'm so lucky <laughs> to, uh, to be in the Olympics. You know, I knew exactly how it gotten there and made a lot of choices along the way to be there and not be doing other things. So, yeah, I, I, um, I was number one in the world. Well, I should say I should start with um, I was very lucky in that when I was 11 years old, my family moved to Jacksonville, Florida, and there was a great coach there, and he happened to be coaching at the high school that I had to attend. It was Jacksonville Episcopal High School, and my dad was working with the Episcopal Church, 
So, right, I, it wasn't like I had any choice or I got to pick where I wanted to train or something like that. Anyway, this guy, Randy Reese, I had been swimming before, but never on any kind of serious level. And he was the one who said, you know, Nancy, if you want to be great, you can be great, but you're going to have to do it. Because I used to like miss practices and I wasn't serious when I did come to practice. <laughs> and, and he's the one who sort of gave me this idea of where you could take swimming, right? It wasn't just, this isn't just some after school activity. This was something far greater than that. And it, and thank goodness I did have that vision of the far greater because that is what kept me in it during those very tough times. But I would say one of the main things that I got out of swimming is being able to push through it even when it is tough. I was just watching a little show with my daughter uh, who's 14 years old and in Elma show like the kid is having a hard time uh, in medical school and um, you know, so they say, Oh, well, okay, just quit. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm, I'm really glad I didn't, I wanted to quit very badly in the hard part of the season. When we're swimming 800 laps a day, everybody was in a bad mood and everybody's crabby with each other and it's cold and it's just not fun. And it, and you're tired. My mom used to say that the, the hardest part of her day was picking me up on practice because I was just in such a crabby mood because I was just so tired and I used to fall asleep in class. And uh, anyway, but I'm really glad that I stuck through it to be able to achieve something. And I would say that that lesson it has stuck with me through, you know, I, I've been working in the area of civil rights and gender equity now for 30 years. And there have been a lot of wins, but there have definitely been some losses. And there have been some really kind of grueling times. But I'm, I'm well prepared for that because of my swimming career. Yeah, and that is really amazing. And to the point I made earlier, you had to make a decision a lot earlier in your life about how serious you wanted to take swimming in order to take it to the next level than most of the traditional sports. Like if you think about a basketball, a baseball, even a football, those kids need to make some life altering decisions about where they're going to go for the next step, but they don't need to necessarily start training at such a high level while they're in high school, for example, before they get to college or before they make that leap to professional oh, ball. I was training that hard in middle school. Right, right. And so <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, I, w I was um, number one in the country for 12 year olds by the time I was 12. Wow. And I had been national record. And then by the time I was 14, I was number one in the world for all women. So 14, I think I was ninth grade. And then at 15, I moved away from home to train for the 1980, the 1980 Olympics, the ones that we didn't go to, the boycott. Right. So, yeah, no, it was, a, it was early, early days. Yeah. Now, how do you make that decision? Because there's going to be that moment, right, where you have to say, am I going all in or is swimming something I just do for fun? How do you make that decision when you're still, I mean, you're not even close to, to being fully formed like your your brain functions and all these type of things <laughs> that can help you for a decision making process yeah, you probably right. had to rely on some different people to help you through that process oh for sure i relied on other people um so first of all i got inspired so everybody on this team that i was i moved to when i moved to jacksonville was taught they were talking about nationals i had never heard of nationals i didn't know what nationals were and um, I got to go to nationals when I was 12 years old. So I was really young, but I was completely inspired. I loved being around these other great swimmers. And this famous guy, uh, Scott Spann, said to me, hey, Nancy, see that woman over there? That's who you want to beat. And it was Shirley Babishoff. And Shirley Babishoff, who won gold and silver at the 1976 Olympics. But this was like before then, right? This is 1975. Yeah. So number one is the inspiration. But number two is, like, I, I really depended on both my teammates and my coach to provide the energy for those times that I really didn't want to. My coach had a, my coaches, I should say, I had several in my career, uh, provide, I could rely on them to really be intentional about it on days that I would want to just slack off. 
and again, my teammates, you know, there was a work ethic that was mutually reinforcing amongst each other. There's no way I could have trained that hard without my teammates. I don't know like how like a marathon runner does it, you know, they kind of have to do it by themselves. And I don't know how people do it without a coach. So yeah, really got lucky. (laughs) Absolutely. Now you talked about you've, since you finished up swimming, you've spent the past 30 years or so doing a lot of really great work, having a successful legal career and being in civil advocacy and, and those type of things. How have you been able to, I think one of the areas where a lot of our listeners tune in and maybe they're struggling or having challenges is how to transfer attributes that they learn in competition into the real world and into business or into their lives. And you've obviously been able to cultivate a lot of successful aspects of your life, both professionally and personally. So you talked about the grit and that sacrifice and all that work that you had to put in, I think the overarching work ethic (laughs) in order to be successful. But would you say there's some other attributes that you took away from your experience that have helped you continue to be successful? Yeah, I would say reliance on community has been absolutely imperative for both my professional career, for both my swimming career and my professional career. Sort of this this interdependence and interconnectedness with this uh, with a community. Colin, one of the things that you talked we talked about before going on was was I going to be comfortable talking about having been raped when I was in college, and the answer was yes. And um, so I'll just go ahead and bring it up. And uh, so I was out running. Duke has two campuses. And um, uh, a guy grabbed me and pulled me into the woods. And it was awful. It was two and a half hours. I had a fantastic case of PTSD. We didn't call it that back then. We just said, boy, has she ever messed up? (laughs) And there really was no vision or light at the end of the tunnel. How are you going to get out of this? How are you going to recover? And I was able to recover. I actually have a good recovery story because I had a phenomenal community that really lifted me up when I was not lift up a bowl. <laughs> so first of all, I just, my hat is off to Duke University. I work a lot with uh, sexual violence survivors right now whose community does the exact opposite of what I got. So I know how vital that is. And I want to make sure that other survivor, other survivors get what I got. So people around me did two things that were really crucial. Number one is that they believed me. They believed that it happened. And that I think a lot of a lot of victims just don't get. And then two is they believed in the depth of my harm, right? So I did not. What I was telling myself was, "Come on, Nancy, get over it." Which don't do that. That I should never have done that. That was if I could take back one decision in my entire life, it would be sitting at the end of a hospital um, uh, examining room on the table and giving myself a little lecture about how this was not going to impact me and I was going to go on and, and do great things in swimming and in academics. And, um, it just could not, I, like, I might as well have been sticking hot pokers in my eyes and ears and my whole body. And, but, but the community didn't do that. So when I got a lot of parking tickets because I was having a hard time, I was, I was raped in cold night air and that just would, like set like my nerve endings on fire. So I would park really, I would park illegally very close to where the dorm was. And they gave me a special parking pass rather than making me pay the tickets or scold me and Nancy, get over here and park in this other parking lot. Um, they gave me all kinds of academic accommodations to make sure that uh, my educational trajectory didn't get off course. They, uh, I got to red shirt for a year. So I got a full scholarship and did not have to swim for a year. And I really needed that time off. So, um, and then just my friends and my family and other people who were really believed those two things. And so, you know, the Duke swim team really lifted me up. I mean, everybody was felt really bad that this had happened to me and, 
my really good friend, uh, Terry Conklin, she's the one who picked me up from the hospital. And she just kept telling me in the months afterwards, like, oh my gosh, you're doing so great, Nancy. You're doing so good. And I didn't feel so great. I felt terrible. But it was like getting into the pool on the days that you really don't want to with every cell in your body. (laughs) And you do it anyway, because, right, it was the same kind of thing of like, I could kind of lean into what Terry would tell me. <clears throat> sort of not believing it, but kind of leaning into it. And and my own professional work, like I really depend on the people that I work with. I really, the women who, men and women who work in this area of women's sports, uh, were a very tight knit group. I love them very much. They have, in in many ways, some of my heroes pushed me into leadership positions well before I was ready for it. But they they pushed me. Right. And they were there for me and I could always ask questions. But the power of community, the power of, you know, having 60 people with you on that swimming pool deck and the power of having all of the civil rights people on the same page and supporting one another and being there for one another has really been been really valuable to me. And now that I'm, I'm 57 years old, uh, be 58 soon and how important it is for me to repeat that and make sure that the people who are behind me, I, I really, all, every one of those Larry Nassar survivors, he's the physician who molested over 400 gymnasts. Yes. And I want to make sure that if they want to ha- use a pla- have a platform to be able to speak out, I want them to have it. And I want them to, whatever the message is that they think that, that the society and community doesn't understand or doesn't have, I want them to to feel supported and to do their very best and to, you know, whatever help it is that me and other people who have been doing this for a long time can do. But it is the power of community. I want to start by saying thank you for being willing to open up and share that experience with us. I really do appreciate it, but I also truly believe in the power of sharing those stories and how it can help other people that may have unfortunately gone through the same experience. And I know myself personally, about 10, 11, 12 years ago now, I can't remember exactly the year, but I was going through some clinical depression and for a male to come out and talk about that 10 to 12 years ago, far less accepted than it is today. And and so I, I know how difficult it can be to have these conversations and to be vulnerable and open up. But I really do appreciate that. And there are a couple aspects that I'd like to get your opinion on, if you don't mind. The first being, you talked about how supportive Duke University was and just that entire community, whether it was your family and friends and people that knew you and how supportive they were. Throughout your both your personal experience and then the work that you've done, since that time, it seems like there may be a bit of a disconnect when it comes to getting the support of a community. Can you talk about maybe why the reasoning is behind that? Sure. Rape culture. I mean, if, if, if a woman does the slightest deviate, I mean, almost no matter what she does, it's like, why didn't you? Mm -hmm. And you should have. And so they get that support yanked out from underneath them. You know, I, I was really lucky that that didn't happen to me. Like looking back, like there had to be some, t- some people who were not so supportive, but uh, they, if they were, they were sort of shielded from me. The woman who <clears throat> at the institution at Duke was Sue Waslick, my son, is now a uh, freshman at Duke University, and his resident advisor is Sue Waslick, the same woman. I'm like, (laughs) you were born under a lucky star. She was 26 years old. You know, she gets this, you know, rape victim who I I was not appreciative. I was not thankful for all the things that she did for me at the time. You know, and she really bent over backwards for me. And it wasn't until, like, I started (laughs) representing other people other victims that I realized just how lucky I was and how good I had it. Gosh, no wonder, you know, I have, I was a, you know, I have such a great life and I was able to win, you know, just two and a half years later, I won three gold medals in the Olympics. 
And I think if we all lifted each other up, like, you know, Colin, who lifted you up when you were coming, when you were had depression and what would, you know, how, how you were able to lead this amazing life now and, and talking about dynamic leaders for other people because the community really supported you. So I, I really see, you know, that, that when, when I look at like, why wasn't, why did my client who also played on a sports team and was told they had to quit and this person actually needed the emotional and bonding support and feeling of belonging from their team membership. They actually wanted to keep playing um, and they weren't allowed to, or another athlete who was told that she wanted to quit, which is the opposite, but they said, we're going to take your scholarship from you. So she, her family couldn't afford to have her there if she didn't get a scholarship. You know, sometimes the schools, like they say, oh, here, let us give you accommodations. And they load up the poor kid who then has to go to not only classes, but into therapy. And then they, maybe they need physical therapy because of, you know, something that happened during the rape. And then they uh, need tutors because they're falling behind. And then like they, they now have 12 hour days when they're really going, you know, they, they need to have like the lesson, they need to have things pulled off, not the other, not, not heaped on back off. Like let them have a semester where they drop out of two classes, which is what I did. Let them, you know, like it, it, it's sort of a, this predictable down and then back up and just be there while they go down and back up. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the, the other aspect unfortunate part about everything was one of the first things you mentioned when you started telling the story was that you were fortunate that people believed that it actually happened to you. Yeah. Yeah. And that can sometimes I think I went to Penn state and I have done my homework and research and understanding on child abuse, which in some ways overlaps in other ways is different, sure. but understanding how, how difficult it is to build a case against somebody like a Jerry Sandusky or like right. a Larry Nasser, who right. we now know are just monsters of people, but how difficult it actually is to build a strong case. Because once you blow that whistle, if you don't have the case in place, mm -hmm. then it, it's arguably worse. Like uh, the, the situation yeah. becomes worse because now that person's out there free, able to do whatever they've been doing. So I don't even know if there's an answer to this, but so maybe I'll, I'll phrase it this way. Why do we not believe these people? Like, why is it so hard for us to believe that a child or that a woman is getting raped and it just happened? Like, it, yeah, I, I just, well, I don't know. Because, yeah. I think, yeah, because most rapists don't look like monsters. Right. Larry Nassar looks like a monster now because we saw him on television. We had all these amazing women <clears throat> who one after the other went and just, you know, took their turn with a knife and stabbing him. So he really looks like a monster. But at the time, he was beloved and he was everybody's best friend. And he right? So and, and it wasn't until the number of victims hit about 50 that the victims started being believed. 50. The reason why I was believed, I can tell you, is because A, I was beaten up. Two, I went directly from the rape to the police station. And three is um, I didn't know him and I hadn't been drinking and I wasn't wearing a swishy skirt, all of which I have done numerous times and could have been raped. So number one is we tend to believe that rapists are monsters and they're not they're not until after they've already been right, they've right. been um exposed shown to be monsters yeah but they don't look like that beforehand and then two is for the victims how often that we don't um appreciate you know if their if their behavior or if the circumstances don't fit this very narrow category I was actually lucky in a sense that my rapist had no power, right? So he was a stranger who didn't smell good. He was not like the dean of students or he wasn't my supervisor. He wasn't, 
um, my coach or somebody who held any authority over me. I wasn't trying to get a part in a movie role or a modeling or um, I wasn't trying to, it wasn't my boss, right? The person, ha he had no power. So it's very easy to, right? But it would have been much, much, much harder on me if who I was speaking on was somebody like Sandusky who everybody loved mm -hmm. and who was seen as sort of a saint of helping these underprivileged boys. So I didn't have that. And, uh, and, and so people, it was sort of safe to feel sorry for me. Um, and, and as I said, if, if we want to create a community where these one in four women and one in seven men who are sexually assaulted, whether it's childhood or in college or wherever, we need to make it, we need to have a community that believes women and believes men and who believes in how damaging it is, how harmful it is. I had a million conversations with myself about Nancy, just, you know, just essentially don't have PTSD, just get to sleep, <laughs> just quit being so weird about checking <laughs> locks on doors. And it didn't matter how many of those conversations I had, I still did it. Yeah. I was still checking the doors. So, no, I, if we want to empower more dynamic leaders, we need a, the community to help in the healing process. And that involves uh, – some women don't come forward because they're afraid that they're, they're going to get blamed and lots of other reasons. But there's a lot of women who I've talked to. I have the privilege of having – you know, being in that world and they don't talk about it or they don't want to press charges or anything else because the, number one is they don't want their world upended. And two is they think that the best way to recover from how awful they feel right now and the trauma they're experiencing is to forget about it. And they think that that's possible to forget about it and to compartmentalize and whatnot. And I don't think that's possible. And in, in my, just my experience, I'm not saying this is truth. I'm not a scientist or researcher, but in my experience, people are really glad that they fought hard, that they did go through the process, even when they didn't win, because they stood up for themselves. And the, the opposite side of that is I encounter a lot of women who feel badly that they didn't, but I don't encounter women who feel badly that they did really fight for themselves. Hey everyone, Christine here from Sweat with Stods, one of this show's sponsors. The Dynamic Leaders Podcast is here to help you be a better leader, and the best leaders take care of themselves both mentally and physically. I'm here to help on the physical side by making fitness accessible to everyone. As a certified personal trainer with years of experience coaching fitness classes, I've designed programs that can be followed at home and in the gym. These are intelligently structured programs, giving you a plan to follow to help you be successful. Build strength with my Get Strong at Home program, get quick results with Hit at Home 1 or 2, or work on your health outside of fitness with my Healthy Habits program. As a listener, you can get these programs at a discounted rate by entering code DYNAMIC at checkout. That's D-Y-N-A-M-I-C at checkout. So head on over to sweatwithstods.com, that's sweat with S-T-O-D-D-S dot com to take the next step toward achieving your health and fitness goals today. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to this podcast that are wondering how they can help or how they can be able to create this community that you said that's mm -hmm. better suited for these type of situations. And I know there's a Senate bill out there, 2330, called the Athletes, Survivors, and Supporters of Olympic Sports. They're seeking greater protection for rights, funding, development, governance, uh -huh. leadership for athletes. Can you talk a little bit more about that bill and how we can get involved? Sure. In all my work dealing with um, sexual abuse, <clears throat> I was I did most of my work, my earlier work, you know, 10, 15 years ago, dealing with <clears throat> schools. Under Title IX, the, the statute that allowed me to get a college scholarship, it also protects uh, students who are in school and makes sure that sexism and that sex discrimination doesn't keep them from being able to, get, to reach their educational goals. So then I started getting very similar calls from people who were in the Olympic movement, meaning 
the one of 16 million athletes who are competing in sports that are not associated with schools. Okay, so we think of a club sport that is maybe a travel team or a, you know, a taekwondo or a right or equestrian or whatnot, but it's not associated with a school. Okay, so that's typically part of the Olympic uh, movement. So I realized those athletes had no remedy. I mean, there was no, you know, schools about Title IX offices, businesses have HR departments, and those sometimes they're <laughs> terrible offices, but at least it's there. There is nothing for for Olympic athletes. And when I speak Olympic athlete, I'm not saying, you know, the 600 athletes that go to the Summer Olympics every year. I mean the 16 million athletes that are part of our sports system in America. So, you know, we have done, you know, we've created the United States Center for Safe Sport or, you know, pushed for that to happen. And so now we're looking at what kind of change needs to be made. If you go onto a website, it's very easy. USOPU, United States Olympians and Paralympians Unbroken, dot info, I-N-F-O. You can find out all the information about how we need to restructure the Olympic movement so that athletes have more power. There have been four major reports that have come out since NASAR that have detailed sort of what went wrong. And one of the major things that went wrong was this culture of obedience and compliance, this culture of the athlete has to be subservient and has to be a major pleaser in order to be able to make the team. And if they are sexually assaulted, they have to be quiet about it and they have to not cause problems for the administrators. So that, that whole system of obedience and compliance and subservience, we need to, you know, you, you, you don't find that in the NFL or the, the NBA. How can we have our, our athletes, Olympic athletes, have the authority to be able to say no and have some say so in their athletic careers in ways that right now, uh, Sally Jenkins just wrote an amazing article that talked about how the most amazing athlete in all of Olympic history, Michael Phelps, desperately needed help with depression, like you. And he got no help. This guy made millions, if not billions of dollars for the Olympic movement. And no help. All they were interested in him was how many medals he could win. For him, he was just like a, a racehorse. They were not interested in how well he was doing. And uh, uh, Katie Ulander, another uh, four-time Olympian, and talks about how she was not helped. She was, you know, any kind of depression or uh, mental issue was seen as a weakness and a reason why they would take away her stipend or her money that the Olympic Committee gave, which, by the way, was crazy paltry. So we need to restructure the Olympic movement. There is a statute that governs the whole Olympic movement. It's called, the short name is called the Sports Act. The long name is the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. But the Sports Act, we just need to rewrite that because it was written at a time when there was this thing called amateurism. Amateurism doesn't exist anymore. It ended in 1992. It ended over 30 years ago. And we're still operating in a world like they're supposed to be doing it just for the love of country instead of <laughs> the way every other athlete works. There's a lot of money being made on these, those Olympics. So USOPU.info, it's Senate Bill 2330. It's bipartisan. It's uh, supported by Senators Moran and Blumenthal, Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut, and many others. Um, has lots of sponsors. It's already made it out of committee. So, um, but we, we really need people to sign on there. I will put that information right into the show notes. So that'll be easy access for anyone that wants to show their support and continue to build that platform. Nancy, so your business champion woman in a broader sense, right, is about supporting the advocacy for girls and women in sports and we just talked about one very specific way you can get involved, but in a more broader general sense, 
we want to be able to empower women to continue to advance and get more opportunities and get into positions of influence and leadership and those type of things. What can we do besides supporting that bill on a more broader sense and a more general basis to help support this movement and help continue pushing it forward? Oh, oh I'm so glad you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a real athlete advocate, meaning um, I got a lot out of sports. I'm so grateful to have had a sports experience. I'm so grateful that I had a college experience and on and on, right? It, it was, it, it really brought me through some tough times and I want more girls and women in particular to have that sports experience. So one thing that everybody out there can do is just to look at the facilities that are given to boys and girls and they're your high school or college or club or whatever. And if you see differences that sort of would denote that women were getting second class citizenship, (laughs) second class treatment, um, then that's like your red flag that that you can do something about it. The law really protects that. But what we need are more families, more school communities saying, hey, that softball field is nowhere near as nice as that as the, the men's uh, baseball field. You need to make those two things equal. Hey, the, the girls don't have the same locker rooms. Hey, they don't get to travel the same way. Hey, they don't have the same quality coaching. How come you're spending twice as much on the men's coach as you're on the women's coach? If it's because he's a better coach, then you're shortchanging the women there. So the more the people uh, speak out and are willing to make it better for their kids, the bigger the change is going to be. You know, Champion Women is a small organization. You can donate at (laughs) championwomen.org. All one word, championwomen.org. What we depend on is that thing we were talking about before is the community. We partner with lots of other groups and families and organizations to make the kind of change that is in the community. So as a lawyer, I could have just done the cases, but instead of just doing the cases, I wanted to do to take on these efforts to get bigger change than just a one off, bigger changes than just one fix uh, the softball field at one particular school, right? How can we get change to scale? And that's what we focus on. So we're good at that. We're good at building communities. We have uh, 170 Olympians that have now called for the board of the United States Olympians and Paralympians committee, the, the corporation to resign, that they are not the right people that are going to take an athlete centric position. Again, it's creating that community to be able to do that. And that's something that I'm good at, that Champion Women's good at, that it is building that community that, again, I I still owe that from sports. That's so cool. And again, I'm going to put the link to the site in the show notes, so super easy reference for anybody listening. And I think the two key points that – I'm going to continue to focus on and hopefully be able to make a, an imprint in some way is that the easiest thing you can do is just speak up. Say if you see something that needs attention, say something. And I mean, that can go for what we were talking about in the more serious sense when we're talking about rape situations or abuse situations, say something. But that also goes with just talking about equality. And uh-huh. if the softball field isn't up to par with the baseball field, why is that? Start asking questions, get curious, try to figure it out. Right. And then the other aspect, I think, and this was probably the more interesting thing to me, and I'd love to learn more about this in the future, is how do we scale it? Like, how do we make it large scale changes versus just these one-offs here and there where like a UConn women's basketball team is, you know, head and heels above the rest of the sport for 10 years. And now we're just starting to see like Oregon and South Carolina and Baylor start to catch up, but it took 15 years for it to get to that point. How do we speed up that process? So those are all really interesting points. And well, I've I've just enjoyed this conversation so much and learned so much from you, Nancy. And I really think that you've 
portrayed well why you are a dynamic leader and why you are on this show. And before I let my guests go, I always like to give them an opportunity to shout out to get a person or two that really is influential in their own life from a leadership perspective or just in general. Do you have somebody that you'd like to give a shout out to before we let you go? Wait, wait, wait. I only have to, I have to only pick one? No, you could pick as many as you want. Oh, thank God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My hair is going to be in trouble. Um, yeah, Donna Devarona really inspired me when I was at the 1984 Olympics. She continues to. She's a dear friend. Uh, we were at each other's weddings. Donna Lopiano is one of the people I was telling you before about who just kept pushing me into leadership roles. Um, Richard Lapchick is... Um, He's amazing, and he's at University of Central Florida, and he's the one who said, Nancy, you need to talk about your rate publicly, and I didn't for 20 years, and I'm, I'm really grateful for him for, for encouraging me in that way. Um, Ellie Smeal is head of the National Organization for Women and Fem- uh, the uh, Feminist uh, Movement, and uh, she's also a Duke grad who I met when I was you know, probably 21 years old. My professor at, at school, Jean O'Barr, was a women's studies. Um, she started the women's studies department. When I go to Duke, you know, we still get together. She's still inspiring me, always has like new ideas of things for me to do. And Dean Sue, Sue Waslick, who's uh, still growing in, uh, she has, we're talking about a growth mindset, <clears throat> but so many people who um, I, I'm really, I admire greatly people who I think just have great integrity. That's something I look for. My husband has great integrity. Yeah, no, I'm appreciative for all of them in my life. I think that's an appropriate way to end this conversation, given the fact that we've talked so much today about how important community has been in your life. And for you to shout out that little community of dynamic leaders, I think is an excellent way to end this conversation. And Nancy, I just want to say thank you again for being open and vulnerable to share about your personal experience, but also for sharing your expertise and your guidance with everyone. You are most welcome. And thank you for this opportunity. I'm glad you've got this podcast and, uh, No, people want to reach out, they can reach out through our uh, our website.